Well, welcome everyone. I am Elisa Villardo. I'm Deputy Commissioner for DDS, and I'm so excited to host today's Fourth Tuesday Forum on Innovative Options. Um, we will be recording today's session uh, for those that are interested in the topic but who were unable to join us today. And recordings of the Fourth Tuesday Forum can be found on the DDS website under Fourth Tuesday Forums, and we have all of the previous forums that have taken place over the last year and a half. So if you're interested in some of the topics that we've covered, um, you have access to all of the previous recordings, and I urge you to check them out. There's some incredible stories that have been shared. Um, our Fourth Tuesday Forums really are an opportunity for individuals, families, providers, and our DDS team members to come together and learn more about some core components, um, some, some really innovative options of um, supporting transformation to empower people, also known as STEP. Each month, uh, we hear from our DDS team members, um, our, our provider community, and most importantly, from individuals and their families about a featured topic and how it has been beneficial uh, in the lives of those who share their stories. I'm very excited um, to join with you uh, for today's topic, remote support solutions, because remote supports is one of our uh, newly emerging waiver services. And we've made a huge amount of uh, progress and, and seen a lot of traction in the last year. And so I'm really excited to hear today's presentations. We do hold all questions until the end of the presentations to make sure that we get um, through the presentations. But if you have a question, you can feel free uh, to write it in the chat and the chat button. Um, you'll see the feature uh, with the features, it's that little thought bubble. Um, if you click on that, you can write any question that you have, and we do have some of our team members today who will be helping to monitor the chat and may drop some resources or some information in the chat as well. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Patricia Simbola, our Director of Assistive Technology, who will share a bit about what we mean when we talk about remote supports. Uh, welcome, Patricia. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner. Remote supports is, is a great service. It's a service model. It's, it's a wavered service and it's offered at, from a remote location. It provides individuals with the opportunity to receive assistance um, in more independent settings. Sometimes when we think assistive technology and remote supports, we think technology, but they're different in the sense that assistive technology is the tools, the products, the devices that make assistive technology, that make remote supports happen, excuse me, that make remote supports happen. Um, it, is, it is a great, great service. It's designed to offer guidance, oversight, supervision, assistance to individuals in many different aspects of daily living, through communication, through skill development, through health management. It provides that, uh, that personalized, tailored support to individuals who need um, the prompting of independence and improving the quality of their lives. It makes a difference in a lot of people's lives and we're seeing it, we're seeing it all over the country, we're seeing it here in Connecticut. It allows individuals to access necessary care and attention while maintaining their sense of autonomy and the connection still within their communities. And it can facilitate the opportunity for someone to remain in their own home as well. Today, a lot of people are gonna be talking about remote support and they will define it more in depth, um, but please look into it. It's a it's a great great service, and, and the technology is moving so quickly and advancing that it is really becoming a wonderful service. So thank you very much. Thanks, Patricia. So we wanted to start out with sharing a short video. When I say uh, remote supports have come a long way, about a year ago, we held a, a forum on remote supports. And at that point, we were just piloting remote supports within Connecticut. And um, uh, uh, this video was shot a couple months ago and um, it just uh, captures, it gives you a visual and describes a little bit about what we mean by remote supports.
we don't have audio. Drive two-way communication. One moment. With the remote support. Um, Go with take two, I apologize. It really, again, kind of gauges on what somebody's level of need is. And that's usually the team sitting down and saying, there's 24 hours in a day. If somebody has seven hours a day of face-to-face -face support, how many hours of remote support does the team feel that they would require? So it's all specific to everybody's needs. Everybody's of home is checked differently depending on what their need is going to be. Typically you'll find cabinet sensors, water sensors, usually at the sink or toilet. We also have bed sensors and we also have in the living room a motion detector. Inside the unit, right by the door, there's iPads so that the individuals are able to see who's ringing their doorbell. We're able to have feed to it as well. So on our end, we're able to see who's at the door and if the individual's not opening the door, to able to contact them and let them know that it's safe to answer the door. All right, so that's just a little snip to kind of kind of uh, wet the appetite. And uh, now we have a couple um, uh, remote support providers that are going to join us. They'll share more stories and and really get into the nitty gritty in, in terms of what um, what can be provided and how it can be customized. So next, I'd like to um, introduce Kyle Corbin from Safe and Home, and welcome Kyle. Uh, who's going to share a little bit about uh, remote supports that are offered through Safe and Home. Thank you. Is this working? Hopefully the slides are showing up properly there. They are. Wonderful. All right, so as, as mentioned, my name is Kyle Corbin. I am with Safe and Home. And let me tell you a little bit about who I am and, and how I got to doing remote support services for folks before I go too far in to it, how it is that we do. So I used to work for the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. I helped the State Department build remote support and assistive technology services in Ohio and, and worked on pushing that forward and becoming a technology first state. I wrote a lot of the rules and regulations involved with that and worked with multiple states on, on how to help them as well become remote support centered states. Prior to that, I worked for a provider agency and ran a provider agency for a number of years. So I'm very familiar with the first person aspect of not having enough staff to fill needs and for working with individuals that need that are ready for a little more independence but just need a new method of, of finding that independence so remote support is a, a perfect fit in both parts of those sections so i want to give a little more about how my unique background fits where i've done both ends of, of provider agency as well as as public service so you know as mentioned remote supports is is a system that that empowers people to be independent in their own homes and communities. It isn't a substitute for, it doesn't replace direct support professionals, staff in the home. It, it doesn't knock anybody out of a job. That's a question we have all the time. Well, it's gonna take the jobs of our, our, our DSPs. We've yet to displace one DSP out of anywhere. What we do is, is we help fill in those gaps and we help people become a little more independent. And we just, provide staffing in a different way. We use technology as opposed to uh, in-person delivery. So the, the way that we look at it is, uh, as Patricia mentioned, every single person has a specific solution that is geared towards them. And it's done on an individualized basis where one of our account executives, they'll come in, they'll sit down with the team and they'll talk about what's important to this per for this person, what's important to, and what's important for the person. And then they'll build a solution together that takes into those goals that are already written into the individual service plan. And we just look at how we can apply technology and remote supports to help people get to those next steps. 
So whether that's providing safety for someone that has seizure, a seizure disorder or fall risk, or maybe they'll let someone in the house that would potentially do them harm, or they have more independent type goals where maybe they want to be a little uh, more uh, self-sufficient in the kitchen and be able to follow a grocery list and pick out things, or they want to be able to travel in their community uh, uh, better than they currently do with some safeguards in place. We can provide all of those services to really help people become more independent, really flourish where they're at. So just to, to reiterate this point is it's, it's a service, it's not a thing. Remote support isn't a laundry list of, of pieces of technology where you just take a grab bag and try to cram technology into places. It, it absolutely is a service and it's using that trained workforce to connect people through technology and help people become more independent and, and live their best lives. So who are the, the people that, that best would benefit from, from our solutions and, and where do they fit in? This is a, just a, a quick example of, of where it makes sense and, and some of the things we do. And, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but medication management. So helping people with self-medication, when to take their pills, how to take their pills. Uh, we can ensure that they did, that, that pills were taken. Overnight support is a big one that, that a lot of people start with when we're looking at, I want to try remote support out, but I don't know where to begin, or I'm a provider agency that would like to, that I have some people that I think would be a good fit for this, but I'm not sure how to start. And overnight support is one that, that gets a lot of, of first looks. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is you know, how often are we paying staff people to be in the home just in case? or they've been there and, and we've not had an incident report or really a need for that overnight staff for months, but we continue to maintain and put that there. And of course it puts that burden on the provider agency to staff that shift and oftentimes paying overtime and, and we're, we're scheduling our staff 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week leads to staff burnout. So looking at overnight support is that, that first avenue of introduction is, is usually a uh, an easy start. I mentioned visitor safety. Elopement is one that we get a lot of questions on as well. Why do people elope? Well, they're either going to or away from something, right? And as I mentioned, I, I, were, I ran a provider agency for a number of years. I was actually a case manager for a number of years um, after that. And how often is it that the biggest issue that the person that you're working with or your loved one is facing is that they just don't get along with the staff person in their home. And it's a constant area of, of contention. What we have seen in our experience is the best tool for the reduction in elopement is remote support. So eliminating that staff person from the equation and allowing that person to be independent and function in their own home without having someone there that, that is causing that uh, contention with them. And it's not an all or nothing, and it's not an overnight fix, right? It's not today we have staff, tomorrow we go directly to remote support. It's something that we can ease into, that we can help people become familiar with. And, and oftentimes what we see is, is when we're starting someone new on the service, that billing starts slow and then increases over time as people get a feel for it and, and be more comfortable with how remote support supports the person. Some of the others, I mentioned kitchen safety. We can add sensors on things like a stove. So I want to be more independent on the stove, but I also have a tendency to walk away from that stove and maybe leave the burner on. We can have a sensor on there that'll turn that off after a set amount of time. Same with water in the sinks. There's a number of different pieces. We have about 90 items of technology that we can utilize to really customize and craft someone's home into the environment that they need. Seizure management, I mentioned, perfect service for those transition age youth, people that are coming out of high school, looking for their first jobs, ready to move out of mom and dad's home. They've been using technology their whole life already anyway. It's easy for them to look at that as just a, an extension of, of what they're already doing. After school, after work support, this is one we see a lot of too. I get off, I get home from school at three o'clock. Mom and dad don't get home until five. I have two hours where I could really use some support, but it's impossible to find a staff person that's willing to drive out to where I live for two hours 
to provide that support. Remote support can be a, a fit in those situations. So I want to talk about how it works, what it looks like, how it works together. So as I mentioned, we have about 90 different items, and those are, are generally sensors, but they fit into a, a wide variety of other categories as well, as you can imagine. But they build a, a structure around the home. And again, every single solution is, is dependent on what the actual needs of the person are. So there can be as much or as little as that person needs, but those that system, those sensors in that system work together to send alerts to our staff. And our staff can communicate with the individual through our, our typically it's through our, our tablets. It's basically an iPad. We often mount on the wall, but it can be handheld and walked around again, depends on what makes sense for the person. It can be done through someone's cell phone if that's, if that's the way. But what the, that tablet does is it's a closed unit and it allows for two things. One, a push of a button, direct communication with our staff who are available 24 seven, or our staff alternatively can reach out to that individual. So we do that in a number of ways, either through set calls. So it's six o'clock, we're gonna call you every day and remind you that it's put, you know, it's time to take the trash out and you gotta take your evening meds and don't forget to get dinner started or you know whatever is in that person's support plan for, for what their needs are. And the other part of it is, Individuals can reach out at any time, 24-7. You know, three o'clock in the morning, I heard a noise. Can I'm, I'm scared. Can you check and see if there's any movement in my home and see if anyone's walking around? Our staff can look at the sensors and see that there's nothing going on. We can work directly with uh, folks. So here's here's a great example. We have an individual who has a fall risk, but he one of the things he loves to do is he'll sit at his table and do puzzles, and he'll do those for hours on end. So the our sensors... They, they get a, what's called a stuck alert. So if this person isn't noticed moving around their home and in 20 minutes, we reach out to that individual. So in this case, this person doesn't want to be bothered with us giving a call or reaching out through the tablet. So what he requested was, can you just put a camera over top of the table where my puzzle is? And if I'm not moving around, just check in, see that I'm there. And, and so that's what we do. And again, this is a very specific situation. We'll check in, 20 minutes go by, we don't get a, an alert, we check in, he's doing puzzles, we know all as well. But if we check in and he's not there, then we know that we can reach out as per the next step in his plan to see, okay, are you safe? Is everything going on? Did you have a fall? Do you need help? And then we can escalate from there as needed. So speaking of um, a little more about our staff, our staff are trained in ACT, behavioral techniques, acceptance commitment therapy, that means it's non-directive, that they're, they're not telling people this is what you're going to do or this is what you have to do. It's working with people throughout that uh, throughout the day and through any interaction. Our staff are trained just like any other staff person in the home. They go through all the same trainings that you would send someone into the home with. So all that orientation, all those site-specific trainings, they know the person's support plan. They actually have access to it on their screen when an interaction occurs so that they can pull it up and reference it so they know what's expected for each and every interaction that they have with someone. We are currently in 19 states across the country. We serve over 2,000 people. Our staff can receive calls from anyone from any of those states, so they have to be trained in every single aspect of what's required for each state. So as you can imagine, while there's a lot of overlap in states, there are some trainings that are uniquely expected by state. So our staff are actually tend to be trained much more strictly than staff that would actually go in the home in a particular state because they're gaining um, uh, more from across the country. So the other piece of it that is important to folks, or another piece, I should say, not the other, is the staffing notes, the weekly reports that come through. And every time that we have an interaction with an individual, whether it's a call that we make or a call that comes in or a sensor alert, it generates a report. And it could be something as simple as front door opens, front door closes with a timestamp, or it could be, like I mentioned before, we have a stuck alert that occurred. We checked in with this individual. He's, he is, uh, on a, he's working on his puzzles, all is well. And so anytime our staff are doing those check-ins, they're going to generate that report. This has been a wonderful tool for things like 
how often is someone up walking around at night where we may not know if they're getting six, seven hours of sleep? How often are they using the restroom? Are they using it? Are they in the restroom all the time? Are they not going in there at all? So then that can be as simple as having a sensor by the door that just logs activity. So that information can be useful when reaching out to a physician to, to say, hey, this, there may be some concerns here that we need to look at because this person was using the restroom nine times yesterday and and five times overnight they had to get up to use the restroom and and we may need to take a look and see what that what that is so all of those interactions are are documented and and, and time stamped so again someone who ran a provider agency for a number of years i know what it's like to go through the logbook pull open the page i know that a staff was there from 9 a.m until 5 p.m and the log note says had a good day and that is it right so it's going to be a lot more of than 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 what you get in those uh, often in those situations. So how does it work together? What does it look like? The way our system works is it starts with a consultation, and that is just a request for service that goes out to to one of our account executives. And we have local account executives that are available um, in in Connecticut that can that will sit down. They'll meet with the team in person. And again, talk through those things that we talked about, what's important to you, what's important for. After that consultation, they'll go to proposal. They'll put that proposal together, incorporating technology into the things that were talked about. Then it's submitted for approval. Once approval happens, we go to install, we'll schedule installation. That can happen as early as 48 hours. Typically, it's a little longer, three to five days. Again, it's going to be dependent on the person. Another piece I want to mention is that we employ our own staff to do the installation. We have our own field service team. They know our systems. They know how they work together. They'll, they're the ones who will come back out if there is a problem, if the technology isn't working the way it's supposed to, if something breaks down. We also train them like we train all the rest of our staff so we know what kind of interaction that individuals can expect when our staff come out there. So once the installation is complete, then, then service can start. So. One of the questions I get a lot is, is how do we get more people on service? What do we do? And the biggest thing that, that, that can happen or the, the best thing that can happen is more education. So meetings like this where people get a chance to talk about what they offer, helping case managers work through the process of how they actually put someone on service, getting families involved, letting individuals know that the service exists, what it looks like, giving them the chance to get a hands-on experience with it and, and, and see how it goes together. It's been interesting in our experience across the country is typically we have case managers with, with one of two things. They either have nobody on the service or they have a bunch of people on the service. So once they've found one and gotten through that first application of helping someone get through it, they realize, oh, this is wonderful. And I know more people that that I'm working with on my caseload that, that can help, that I can help. And then they walk them through that. And so the last thing I wanted to share, this is a, a, a QR code link. Feel free to scan it on your, on your phone. This will pull up a link to our YouTube page where we have a number of videos where people are just living their lives using technology. It'll give you some of the behind the scenes, things that go on with the day in the life of, of how someone utilizing safe and home service um, operates and, and, and what some of those things look like. So Thank you very much for your time, and uh, I, I appreciate you having us uh, and having this forum. Oh, I didn't change it over to the QR code. There it is. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it changed on my end, not on that end. Um, so there, please feel free to scan that code. That'll get you to the YouTube page, and, uh, and it'll, it'll show you some of those videos that I'm talking about. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kyle. And I encourage people to check out these videos. Um, I think... Um, uh, we know through these forums that a, a, a picture, a story paints a thousand wor uh, words and each story is different. And so um, thank you for sharing the QR code. And I'll tell you, I probably sat for an hour doing a puzzle yesterday. And so when you gave that example, I had to chuckle uh, because I, I uh, clearly didn't get off the couch for quite some time. Um, and I love the, the the fact that it can be so customized, so um, accommodating each person's particular uh, needs. So next, I would like to introduce Michael Doucette. Michael comes to us through Night Owl and is going to talk a little bit um, about remote supports through the, the Night Owl lens. Welcome, Michael. 
Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Michael Doucette. I am Director of Development here at Night Owl Support Systems. I am going to open up the presentation and hope that it looks well as well. I'm going to make it full screen here. Does does that look okay for everybody? Oh, well, actually, we can see. see it. Uh, um, Kyle, your hand is up. Sorry, that was an inadvertent hand. I apologize. Uh, Let me see. I'll share it again here. All right. There you all can go. kind of you could see that there. That looks good. Yes, all right. We can. Perfect. All right. Um, well, Kyle did a great job, so I'm going to go ahead and say that he uh, thankfully stole a lot of my thunder. Um, uh, Safe and Home and Night Owl, we've um, been uh, friends for, for quite a while. We're part of a, a coalition of remote support vendors who are, um, like Kyle said, trying to educate more folks on the, the options and the opportunities that are um, available with remote support. So if you do hear some things that uh, sound a little bit of the same, that's there's that's there's probably a reason because <laughs> the reason that that's happening um but hopefully uh I'll, I'll i'll share some of the differences between um safe at home and us and some of the other um, maybe similarities and core reasons why we do some things together but um before we get started uh, you you've heard a lot so far about technology a lot about service aspects of remote supports uh, for us that the technology is as it's been said a few times, just a toolbox, just the vehicle we use to get to where we need to be to support each person that we support. It's not the be all end all. It's not the focus really of any sort of um, support that we provide anybody. Again, it's just tools that we have at our disposal. So I, I like to spend a, maybe a little extra, a couple extra breaths on that in the very beginning to, to tailor the rest of what you're about to see um, and keep that in mind that tech is a part of this, but not the focus and not the be all end all. I wanna take, st take a step back and talk about who we are as a company, Nine Owl Support Systems. Uh, we were essentially the first remote supports provider of its kind um, in the country. We started in 2001, so we've been providing remote supports for over 20 plus years at this point. Um, we're based out of Madison, Wisconsin. That's where, you're, uh, that's where I'm at today, um, beautiful, uh, snowy, icy Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we started at the University of Wisconsin, which is right here in town at the Weissman Center. The Weissman Center is the research and outreach center as well as the USED in the area. Um, and a lot of services and uh, just innovations of all kinds for people with disabilities have come out of the Weissman Center over the years. So we're extremely proud to be um, sort of an alumni of the Weissman Center, if you will. The three faces there have been our owners and founders since we were part of that university project all the way back in 2001. Um, Dwayne on the top, Danny on the bottom left, and Chris on the bottom right. And between the three of them and our admin team, we have over 300 years of experience working with people with disabilities. Um, I don't say that to, to, to brag or to toot our own horns, but just to point out that we're not some Silicon Valley group. We didn't create software and think, hey, let's try it out with people with disabilities. Whether it's academically, professionally, many of us here have also worked at um, residential providers in the past in various states. Um, many of us here have personal connections to the disability um, world. Uh, Chris, Chris's sister, um, who has cerebral palsy, was our uh, second client ever. I have two brothers with disabilities. So a lot of us have um, some skin in the game. And really that experience, that passion, that um, that, that, that time working with people with disabilities, it really just drives us forward in terms of what our mission is, what our goal is, and that's to increase independence as much as we can for each person we support. Independence is going to mean something different, so um, everyone uh, is going to work towards that goal in a little bit of a different way. We know that everyone needs to be safe and secure while they're attempting to be independent, so you might call that goal one or one A or one B, whatever you want to say it. Um, but independence always comes first. Safety and security is always a part of that. And then if we could continue to maybe build on some of the goals that individuals are working on on a regular basis, maybe they just like to form relationships with some of their caregivers. Maybe they are working on taking some of their meds more consistently on their own. Maybe they're working on working through stressful you know, situations and using the resources at their disposal to get through those 
maybe a little bit better or in a different way moving forward. So all of those, all of those goals, all the things that people might be looking for um, or, or looking to attain through being more independent, um, those are the things that we want to foster as well. So just wanted to point out that you know we've we've really been in the industry. We, we feel we come from the industry for quite a while, and we're, we're extremely proud to do so. All right, uh, here is a, a maybe a step back and to look uh, into some key parts of what makes remote supports what it is. Uh, you've heard a few different people explain a few different aspects of what remote sports is so far. Uh, Kyle and Safe at Home together with us and some other vendors, as I mentioned, we're part of a coalition it's called CARES, um, specifically for the advancement of remote supports. We created a large definition, a huge, very wordy, very, um, <laughs> very complex, very involved definition that is much too boring and wordy to put on the screen here today. So I took all, I took a couple key points, maybe some of the highlights that uh, that we think really illustrates what remote supports is, um, how it could benefit folks, and how it really works, um, and put it on the screen here today. Um, so remote supports is a tech-based service that allows trained remote support professionals. We call them RSPs. Think of them as a little bit of a DSP or, or a remote DSP, if you will, a remote in-home caregiver. Um, it allows those individuals to deliver live support from a remote location. They're still providing the same support that someone's already receiving, but as has been mentioned a couple times, maybe done so just in a different way, maybe a different service delivery method, a, a different way to support someone to allow them to work on independence um, and become more independent at the same time. RSPs, those RSP, those remote support professionals, uh, those representatives that we have here that Safe and Home has, um, our RSPs are awake, alert, and they're only focused on providing remote supports while they're here in our monitoring station. Essentially, that means they're not multitasking. They're not trying to complete other tasks. They're not doing anything else. They're not distracted. They would be, we, we ask them to be as focused on individuals as you would expect someone physically in um, your loved one's home to be. So um, when they're here, they're taking their job very seriously um, and they're, act they're, they're very passionate to do so. Uh, remote supports is always selected or should always be selected by the individual and their team incorporated into their existing service plan and done so in a person-centered way. Uh, I could have bet a million dollars that Kyle had, would have had a person centered on his slide deck because that's really the only way that remote supports works well. Um, I'm not saying anything new to anyone else on this call here. One size does not fit all for almost any of the services that anyone um, receives. So for us, that, that, that's exactly the same mindset for remote supports. Um, we want to get to know each person we support, and we want to do that in the best way that that person and their team um, in, is able to do, whether we're having multiple conversations with the individual who's going to use the service, with their team, with their team at a, uh, at, a, at, a, at a residential provider. Maybe it's natural support and we have a couple conversations with different members of their family. What have you? We want to we talk to the people that know the individuals we support best so that, as Kyle mentioned, we could decide together. A person's team and the remote support vendor can decide together what the plan is that we're going to use to make sure that someone's safe, secure, and again, becoming more independent in their lives. Um, and lastly, remote supports is not intended as a wholesale substitute for essentially anything, but specifically in-home staff support. Um, and really, I do think remote supports works best when it's seen as just another piece of the overall circle of care that someone's receiving. You know, someone might receive residential services, day program services, uh, transportation, goal setting uh, help, you know, help in the home, things like that. Uh, we, we feel when remote supports is just seen as another part of their overall circle of care, another way to allow them to be supported and work on goals then it's seen as, you know, it, it's it's not scary. It's not um, it's not something that people are unsure about. It, it seems that it really works best because as Kyle mentioned too, and I think I can't remember if someone else might've done it already. Um, if you get everyone on board on someone's team, remote supports does work, be work better when that's the case, when everyone sees it as a, a valuable um, asset in someone's life. Um, so with that said, you know, one last additional thing to take away from this slide is that 
the word technology, even as just the word, is, is only on this definition slide once. Going back to that first idea that technology, absolutely a part of remote supports, but it's just the toolbox we have. Again, it's just the vehicle we use to make sure we're in the right, we're in the right spot to, to support each person that we do. It is not the be all end all. All right, well, uh, in the 10 or 15 minutes that I have to, to talk about what is the focus if technology alone is not, um, I've broken down a very simplified view as to how remote supports works um, in general, but also with Night Owl support systems. Um, and then I have some common, uh, some, some other information after this, but, um, and if there's any questions, especially since this is kind of a simplified version, I would love to um, you know, address those or maybe even have additional conversations after that. But I wanna start with our remote support professionals um, up in the, at the left hand of the screen. Um, there, again, this is the remote version of the in-home caregivers that are already providing support for, for um, everyone here and your loved ones receiving services. Um, as Kyle mentioned, our, our, our RSPs are trained multiple times over. They're trained the same way that DSPs, that in-home caregivers are trained um, because we're in, a, we're in, in fact, 19 states as well. Um, and some states, are, hey, you did this training in one other state that works for us. Other states are really proud of their own trainings and want us to take theirs. So um, I think our folks are up to 35 different trainings a year at this point, somewhere around there. Um, essentially, that, what that means is that combined with a lot of their experience at uh, residential providers um, have really just given them um, some common ground in terms of what they should expect um, when supporting individuals. Um, these folks uh, are really the minute to minute champions of our service. They support people as things happen in their home based on maybe a sensor sending us some information or schedule check-ins as well, similar to what Kyle mentioned too. Um, you know, I, I mentioned, um, you know, they could kind of wait and react to um, devices that are sending them information. Here's a, a great example. A common device we use is a door sensor. Very simple device tells us when a door has been opened. Usually for external doors and maybe looking for elopement and security issues and things like that. For one person, maybe that person's a smoker. Maybe they smoke cigarettes and our staff should actually expect to see that door being open from time to time as they go out to have a cigarette. Well, as long as they get back into a, back into the home within a certain time, maybe there's no direct action for our staff to take. However, that same device, that same door sensor used down the street with a different person, maybe that door being open represents a true elopement issue. Maybe someone is outside and get this, gets disoriented if they're out there for too long. The, the, the plan that our staff is following might tell our staff to take a different action from there. Call the individual, call someone nearby, um, call someone to make sure that they're safe and secure and they get back inside the house. So those steps are presented straight to the RSP, kind of as Kyle mentioned as well, where our folks don't have to wonder what their next step is. You know, they don't have to look through a bunch of files and think, okay, what house is this? Which door was the door sensor on? The system tells them exactly 21 Main Street, front door. These are the people there. These are your exact next steps. Um, so that's really the, those are our, our um, are champions of the service. That's when they're trying to be reactive to things happening in the home, but they could be proactive as well, such as reaching out for scheduled reminders and check-ins, helping people through small tasks to help them throughout their day. You know, again, maybe there's a storm and they're scared and they just need some assurance um, to get through the day as well. Um, I have a, we have a great funny example. We started supporting this person two Novembers ago now extremely independent gentleman, you, a, a person you wouldn't expect to need maybe additional support. Um, he had a, a job he went to every day. He made his lunch the night before um, and, and then went to sleep. Well, sometimes he lives with a roommate. In the middle of the night, his roommate goes into the fridge, opens his lunchbox, eats his lunch, closes the lunchbox back up, and then the gentleman we support brings an empty lunchbox to work. So all we do to support this individual, we have no technology in their home whatsoever. We call him a couple times in the morning to make sure that he's got, he's still got lunch in his lunchbox and he's not bringing an empty lunchbox to work. And if he is, if it is empty, we redirect him back to the kitchen and help him um, make lunch again for his day. So it could be as involved with tech, it could be as bereft with tech, it could be tech free, tech full, um, whatever it is, these are the folks to make sure that, that the, the individuals using our services are supported 24 seven. 
they on the bottom uh, left hand side of the screen, they pair with what we call local responders or people in the area that we can dispatch to the home if the situation were to call for it. With us being remote and just remote uh, supports in general, um, the remote uh, nature of that service doesn't allow us to physically go over to the home. That local responder piece, in many cases, that's going to be a, a, an employee of the of a residential provider if they're receiving services um, uh, through that. I and Patricia may correct me on some of this as well. I believe it could be natural support. Um, in some states, they allow it. Some some they don't. For us, we just want to know where this person is, how to get in touch with them. Uh, when we should be getting in touch with them, what their backups are, because we want to know if we need to get someone over to the home, maybe someone's fallen and can't get up, There's a, the power has gone out in the home and all of our technology is on battery backup. We know we need to get someone to the home for whatever reason. We want to know where they are, how long it's going to take, and we want them to know to expect that we might actually call them in, in the middle of the night. You know, uh, someone in Connecticut, someone in Danbury getting a call at 3 a.m. from a, a Wisconsin phone number might look kind of fishy the first time they get that. So if we if we maybe plan and, and talk with who that individual is, we get to know who they are, um, that first interaction between us and them, dispatching them to the home is going to go smoothly as well. This left hand side of the screen, you could kind of think of the remote version or the remote side of remote supports. The right hand side is what really makes everything go from the very beginning throughout the lifetime of using our services. Our consumer relations team is a team here that makes sure that all of the plans that we have that we create together are created in the best way for the person that we're, we're supporting. Um, Kyle showed all the reporting um, options that you have with Safe and Home. We've got, uh, in, in a similar way, a ton of different reporting options as well. This team is gonna ask what you're looking for, how frequently you'd like to see it. Um, and just as Kyle mentioned, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna keep our eye on things that maybe we didn't call out, but might be different from what we were told to expect. You know, maybe someone told us that they should get ready for work at and, and maybe try to leave leave the home at, at seven in the morning. Well, we see they're starting to do it at five this week. Is that a sign of a, a change in diagnosis? Is it just a change of behavior based on a change in services? Whatever the reason, we want to get that evidence to someone in their team so that they could take the right steps from there. Um, so our consumer relations team, I can't speak highly enough to the work that that team does. They're the ones that make sure that all of the other pieces are really pointing in the right direction at all times, from when we start creating someone's plan to how we make changes to what technology is used and things like that. And then lastly, we are in close contact with someone's individual team because, again, as I've said a couple of times, that tells us what we're going to put on the plan. That tells us what we might um, do in terms of reactions to things um, and in terms of reporting and what we need to look out for as well. The one thing you don't see on here is technology. And I think for us, that's probably represented by the arrows, really to make things work both in the home of the people we support and here as well. Um, you're gonna hear a lot about tech and Kyle went through some of his examples as well. So I'm not gonna go into great depth here. And this is again, a not, not a full list. I think we could probably have a separate meeting on technology alone. Um, so this is really just to give you a little bit of a flavor in terms of the type of devices we use. Uh, a big thing for us, we try not to use cameras for any type of surveillance. Um, we use them for more uh, communication, uh, maybe what's happening on the outside of the home with a ring doorbell, communication with a tablet or a cell phone um, as well. We try not to use cameras that, that we can just drop in on. For us, that's um, maybe a difference between us and some other vendors. For us, it's a dignity of risk and privacy issue, and we've been able to use some sensor-based devices to get around that. Um, however, we're using the same kind of general array of, of assistive tech um, sensors to see if someone has gotten out of bed when they shouldn't or need assistance to get back, to know if they've clogged the sink or toilet and everything in between, to even just a button where they could press to let us know that they just want someone to reach out. We got someone that uses that when they're in a place where it gets really stormy. We've got another person that presses it because he likes to tell us a joke every day. So for each person, they could use them in different ways, but um, we have uh, devices that can be used creatively based on each person's um, goals and their lifestyle. And then lastly, again, uh, this kind of going back to maybe identifying situations or maybe individuals that could be a good fit for remote supports. 
those first two are similar to what Kyle mentioned, where someone has overnight staff and they're really sleeping through the night. They don't need a ton of support or they've got alone time throughout the day and they've proved and it's proven to be really helpful and successful. Um, that could be a really great place and easier place to start. Individuals that might be looking for more independence, maybe just less people in their home while they're playing video games. Um, you know, teams and families that can get together and all get on board and try and support someone as they're maybe attempting to live more independent, that's going to go better as well. Um, and then if I'm talking with to any providers that are out there today, if you have individuals that are grouped together, potentially, you know, to maybe within a cul-de-sac or an apartment building or what have you, um, you could really gain some efficiencies with that local responder piece, that on-call, that re on-call resource piece, where you can maybe have one support more than just one um, throughout um, throughout a night. But with that said, uh, that's a whole lot at once. I know you've heard a little bit about what Kyle said and what I've said at this point, and you're going to hear even more. So please take this as just the first step of your journey. Um, if you have additional questions, reach out to any of us on the, the meeting here. I know I could speak for everyone. We're all excited to talk about remote supports and to talk about creatively what some options and, and and uh, availability might be out there. So please reach out to us, especially if you're on the fence um, and we could have a, a discussion about what might be um, available. But thanks everyone for having me. We're really excited to get started in Connecticut um, and it's, uh, it's uh, we're really glad, really happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. And when you say, you know, some of this information, um, you know, there are themes. Um, that's what I really appreciate about uh, this conversation and um, the different uh, opportunities I've had to hear about remote supports because there's never a time that I don't think of another application or another option or think about it a little differently. So, uh, you know, some of the um, kind of themes that we're hearing are really good as far as generating thoughts and, and, and how this might be applicable. So thank you so much. Uh, next, I would like to inter introduce uh, Pam Fields and Kat Wood from Mid State Arc. Um, I mentioned that remote supports is our one of our newest um, service options, and um, we are very very grateful to Pam and Kat because where we are today in Connecticut is in large part uh, due to some of the pioneer work that they've done in 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 helping us explore. Uh, remote supports and pilot remote supports and then provide us with feedback in terms of our own uh, systems and processes. So uh, without further ado, welcome Pam and Kat. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to, um, um, I'm Pam, I'm the CEO at MidState ARC, and um, we have worked to put together a remote support product that we designed really um, around our provider system. Um, but it does work with families and individuals living on their own. Kat, if you want to introduce yourself real quick. Hello, everyone. My name is Kat Wood. I'm the Director of Community um, Integration at Midstate ARC. Um, my program works with individuals who are um, receiving individualized services, working on moving into independence, and living in our cluster program which is supported not only by face-to-face -face staff, but a lot with the remote supports. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if I can, there we go. We can see it. You can see it, awesome. <laughs> Okay, um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I misunderstood a little bit, Elisa, so I didn't realize it was a product review. I thought it was more of a general remote supports, and I've done so many of them without concentrating on our product. So I took our product logo off of, off of this um, slide presentation. So our product is ARMS. It's a tech remote support service. Uh, and we have been providing uh, that service since 2014 in Connecticut. Um, our remote monitoring service covers increased independence, safety for the person moving into a less restrictive environment, 
bringing a higher quality of life and promoting full community inclusion and integration. Uh, people have already talked about this, so I'm not going to go into it. Um, we already know remote supports is another way to provide a service to someone with a remote mm -hmm. staff. So I'm going to skip through that. Um, our process is to do uh, meet with the team um, to do an assessment uh, on the barriers to independent living or why someone may um, be looking at a remote support system, identify the different devices, installation and training, and then um, implement a remote monitoring solution for that person. Um, Kat? Yeah. So the process starts with the person support team. And when we say that, we mean the care team. So that's everyone who is involved in an individual's life. That could be your friends, that could be family members, that could be staff, it could be people maybe you've worked with in the past, um, but ultimately the team sits down together and really just kind of explores what the possibilities are for utilizing the remote support and what options potentially are available for somebody to be able to live um, successfully independently in their own home, or it might be a shared home, um, but still be able to help them be as independent as possible. So during the time that the team is meeting, um, some of the things that come up are assessments. Um, assessments are done with the team. It's really just a more detailed look into where somebody's at, right? It doesn't mean that they won't be an appropriate fit for a technology. It just means that it helps us be able to gauge what their needs would be um, in order to have the technology and what type of technology would be best suited inside their home. Um, we do an independent living assessment. This is to gauge how independent somebody is. So are they gonna require someone to be more hands-on? You know, Do they require something to be more of a verbal prompt? Um, and again, just really going through a little bit more detailed what we would find on somebody's lawn. Um, we also do a risk assessment because we wanna see you know, somebody's safety skills. Again, technology is absolutely amazing, but everything can't be tech. And there's certain risk factors that we would have to take into you know, consideration when looking at providing remote supports. And then the assistive technology assessment, which the IT um, specialists would be working with the team, um, going through the different types of technologies, again, using that independent living assessment as well as the risk and safety assessment to really kind of determine what type of technology um, would be beneficial for somebody. The assessment also would include, again, like you're looking at the person-centered plan, you're looking at the lawn, and then any other documentation that would be really pertinent to somebody's day-to-day -day living and how to best support them. The information gathered in these sessions with the care team and any other person who participates um, in, in their life um, would share information. This could be nurses, again, therapists, staff, family members, um, other information that we use is a lot of times the behaviorist might be involved. Um, and then face-to-face -face meetings would be conducted with the person, um, including visits in their current environment and or an environment that they might be um, moving into. Um, prior to implementing any technology, um, like everything has to be addressed. We want to make sure that everybody is comfortable. In order for it to be successful, the individual has to feel comfortable with the remote supports going in there, as well as um, the family members and anybody supporting them. You know, there's a lot of unknowns that come with the technology, which can raise a lot of concerns and fears for the individuals, their loved ones, their friends. You know, so these are these things that we would kind of be working through with the assessor um, and the team. Um, as well as delivery charges, because, you know, as excited as everybody gets, everybody kind of stops and thinks about what's the cost going to be, you know, how much is it going to cost to have the stuff delivered? How much is it going to cost every single month? You know, who's going to pay for the coverage? And these are all those things that we would be talking about during the assessments. So 
so the assessment professionals after that they gather all that information um, they de then make recommendations back to the team and again like kyle and michael both mentioned it's all person-centered and it all goes back to the team for all the decision makings so they'll make recommendations on what type of assistive technologies would best be suited for this person in the environment they're in they'll talk about and recommend a remote support system um, if that is in need uh, for the person. They'll talk about which remote support system would work best. So um, like Mike and uh, Kyle have systems where they have a remote support specialist and a command center that is um, working the system. Our system works a little bit differently where it allows the provider or the family to have that control and to do the remote monitoring themselves. Although we will be doing a command center in the, in the future, that's where we're um, using because that is the most call we've had for that at this point. Um, and also then we'll get into a little more the components of that remote support system because everyone is individualized and it's not one system for everyone. Um, each one uh, will be designed for the person themselves. The team works with the agency to make the decisions, like I said, throughout this process um, and moves forward uh, as, you, as we uh, make recommendations. So um, like I said, each system is customized for the individual. Once the team has chosen the type of remote support system to use, our next step is for the team to choose the components of the remote support system. They need to identify what they want to know from the system. Why is someone using it? Is it because somebody's eloping and the doors open? Is it for stove safety? Is it to make sure they're not wandering around in the middle of the night? There's so many different reasons what information you might need. And the team needs to sit down with the remote support provider and, and identify what those pieces are. Then um, once uh, that is decided, then you pick the types of technology that will start to mention that. So you can put motion sensors throughout the house. Um, our system has an artificial intelligence component to it. So it actually learns human movement. And after a two week period, it knows the person's schedule and how they move throughout their day. And it can let you know when they're off schedule. So it's not just about knowing that a cabinet opened or a door opened. It may be that that cabinet opened when it isn't supposed to open or doesn't usually open or somebody's opening in a door at two o'clock in the morning when they normally um, don't open a door at that time. Um, we did learn when we put in a system, we worked with another agency and they put in a couple systems. They had someone opening the door at two o'clock in the morning because they went out to have a cigarette. Um, so they learned that that two o'clock in the morning door was going to open on a regular basis. There's contact sensors to put in and it's whatever you want to know they're going into, whether it's a refrigerator, a cabinet, whether a door is open, a window is open, a medicine cabinet, whatever it is, you can put a contact sensor on it um, to see if it's opening and closing and if a person's going in and out. I always say, because we work with seniors also, that when you put the contact sensors on a refrigerator, usually with a senior, it's because they're not eating. And sometimes uh, with some of the people we support, it's because they're overeating instead of under eating. So it really depends on the person of why you're putting that sensor um, on the different locations. There's sensor mats that can be put on beds, um, places where people normally stand or sit. So you can also record their movement um, throughout the day and how they're doing in their typical daily routine. There's emergency buttons and pendants um, and panic buttons, all different types uh, for people to wear. Um, and there's new technology coming out. They just introduced a technology in uh, Las Vegas last week that now um, it's supposed to be out in the next year but it will just be able to be placed in the house and we'll know if somebody falls. So while they're at home, they don't have to actually wear a pendant. So the technology is changing all the time and um, our systems will all evolve with that technology as we move forward. We also have two-way video options, uh, which again, like Michael's, we don't use the videos often in the house. We've used them for training purposes when the team asked 
what happens when the person is alone. We'll put cameras in the common areas to um, learn somebody's uh, activity and what's going on. But once they're settled in, we haven't used cameras inside the house. We have used them outside of the house for security purposes and um, things like that. We use door safety, so you do the um, video doorbells, help people answer the door inside safely. You can also answer the door when they're not there, um, and you can help them at the door if they need to. There are smart locks, so people can let themselves in. Um, somebody could let a staff in if there was a staff shift um, and somebody was arriving before the person was home or a caregiver was going in. So there's a lot of different um, options for that. And then there's a ton of, you heard from others, water sensors, whether it's an overflow issue, whether you want to know how many times somebody's flushing the toilet. And if there is flooding or overflows, you want that shutoff valve capability to be able to shut it off from a distance until somebody can get there and solve that problem. There's environmental controls you can put through the house to control heating, to control blinds, switches, lights. Um, anything that plugs in, you can work on all of those uh, systems also. And then there's monitoring of fire and carbon, which is very um, uh, common for all of the systems. Our system also can give you full alarm access if that is something somebody wants uh, for, we can do that. Uh, and then there's emergency response system that can go with you in the community. We also have what's called a connected car. So if somebody's driving, it can connect to the system in the car and you can know that they have gas, that they haven't been in an accident um, and that they're safe in their car. And then, um, like I think everyone talked about, there's many add-ons for our system and other systems that don't um, necessary connect right to our dashboards, but we use them along with it. So there could be an eye guard, which is a stove safety device. There could be electronic med uh, giving system. There could be a microwave sensor, an automatic door opener and closer. Um, and it goes on and on. There's, um, there's uh, OrCam reads if somebody can't read that you could um, add into their systems to make them more independently. And this bottom, which is this shaker, that actually does hook to our system. So if somebody is, is deaf, um, the system can alert them through a shaker system if somebody's at the door, if there's a fire or different pieces like that. And our system can also hook to different color lights. So if somebody is, is deaf and you want a, a, a light for the doorbell or a light because um, another sensor went off, it, um, they can do it with visual cues instead of having everything have to be noise if they can't hear things. Um, and then the other piece when you're doing remote supports, I think that everyone talked about it, isn't a standalone. So you pair it with direct support staff, you pair it with natural supports, community resources like visiting nurses, if they need to come in and do um, med fills or, or checks, transportation, there's ADA transportation that can work. There's meals on wheels if people struggle with food issues and cooking their own food. And there's money management um, systems and programs to help people. So there's just such a variety of things that we can add on to make it all inclusive for someone as they're learning to live more independently. And then one of the things we do at the team after all of that is identified is to know, does the person need a trial? So we can put a, a system in their current environment to know if you want to test them in that environment with remote supports before they move out into their own environment. Um, you can also put it in the new environment and incorporate more staff. And then as you do the trials, you wean staff down to a normal level for independent living. Uh, so there's a bunch of ways um, to do it, but the trials can address all those concerns and fears that a family has with somebody being independent and no one's there all the time. So um, I just wanted to, at this point, just share a little, we had two individuals. Um, we have over 40 systems in Connecticut um, operating now with remote supports. And when we started back in 2014 and a little bit after that, we had some individuals who lived in 24 hour environments. Um, one was um, a gentleman who lived his whole time in a, in a group home setting. 
Um, and he moved out into his own um, environment. He's been living in that environment for almost five years. He now only has 36 hours of direct care staff that he requires using his remote support system. And this year, um, he actually walked the staff over to the leasing office to make sure his lease was signed in because he was not giving up his own house. Mm -hmm. uh, so as they become independent, they get very excited and very adamant um, that they're going to keep that lifestyle. And the other thing is to consider is we had another uh, woman who really struggled living in a group home. Uh, she was requiring uh, two to three person interventions several times a week for safety issues. Uh, we worked with DDS and um, she moved into her own apartment and we did um, put the whole remote monitoring system in there and we did trials with her. That was, um, Kat, you jump in three or four years ago, I think it was. Yeah. Um, so she now lives in her own apartment. She's down to how many hours is it now, Kat? So she's approximately like three hours of IDN a day and maybe like five or six of IHS. Um, and the IHS is really like the staff being in there is more just to kind of help support her because she prefers to have her independence now. Like Pam just said, like once they get a feel for it and they realize how great it is and how successful, how great it feels to be so successful, you know, they, they want to keep that. And she will tell staff, like, I'm going to do my laundry. You could wait here and <laughs> she'll go do whatever it is she needs to take care of. And, you know, with time, we realized um, that she did. She did better with more remote monitoring and less staff um, inside her apartment. And us being able to just, you know, keep an eye when needed has really worked best for her. And she spent years and years with no physical interventions. So, I mean, that's the key part. Her, the quality of her life is just um, totally changed and she's so happy about that. Um, so the other steps to address, and I'm just gonna go through this quickly, is you, people need to be transparent. There needs to be safety nets, lots of education and training. You have to allow time for the change to occur, to people accept a new way of providing supports. You, have, you really need to develop a support plan and a backup plan uh, for things to make sure it's whole. So this really isn't a standalone set it and forget it. It's a whole service and system that continues to monitor and grow with the person. So this is what I had just said before. It's not a plug and play. It's not a solution for everyone and it's not stagnant. It does, it changes constantly. And it also doesn't eliminate all risk. And I don't think any of us want to eliminate all risk. We'd have to live in a bubble. Um, but it's important to just mention that for people. Um, and to go to this uh, point really quick is that it's not for everyone. And there's some diagnosis that would prevent somebody living in a remote support environment without staff 24-7. Um, and these are some of the behaviors over the last 10 years um, that we've had uh, with people that may prevent them from living independently. Um, so if they have a behavior that requires immediate staff intervention, that usually prohibits them from this type of environment. Although we did see with that other woman that over time they were able to do it. So it shouldn't be ruled out, but it just has to be structured a little differently. Um, for for that uh, service. Um, Hi, Pam. I'm sorry to interrupt. If we wouldn't mind um, just getting to the end a little bit here so that we could get into our solution circles discussion before we end, that would be super fantastic. Yep, Thank you so I much. Just, I was just going to wrap it up. Um, oh, perfect. Yes. So um, we Thank have uh, 15 smart homes that we're operating right now. Cat is opening another 10 in the next couple weeks. Um, all using remote support. So it's a great option for people. And Kyle, thank you I'll turn so it over much. You. Thank you so much. And thank you for the great examples um, that you shared. Uh, and uh, I see that there is uh, quite a bit of activity in the chat. So we have one more presentation and then we will get to question and answer. Um, now I would like to introduce Wayne Seidel. Director of Case Management, who um, a while back, maybe six, eight months ago, maybe longer, said, hmm, 
now that we have this great service, how are we going to, um, you know, figure out how to implement it? And so I am so excited to have you share some of the work that's been going on in the solution circles. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you so much, Elisa. Appreciate it. And really appreciate hearing uh, what the um, our provider community is doing to, to help us be ready to uh, increase the amount of these opportunities. Uh, just briefly, I'd love to illustrate some of the themes that I heard along the way as well. Um, we really think of uh, remote support as an opportunity to advance our person-centered principles in helping to promote independence. And when we think of remote supports, um, you know, case management can think of it in three ways, helping uh, one to gain independence, helping some to maintain their independence, and then helping for reclaiming independence. And we just heard uh, a perfect example of reclaiming independence, um, you know, uh, being having an opportunity to move into a less restrictive environment, maintaining independence. We have folks that are uh, currently living independently, but might need have increased needs, and we want to help them continue to maintain that independence uh, as long as possible. And then, of course, gaining independence, you know, it's scary sometimes, uh, the fear of the unknown, uh, taking that first step. Um, and so, you know, we do look at, at remote support as being another option to help, uh, uh, you know, alleviate that, that unknown. Um, I'm actually my, my computer is freezing up, so I'm not able to unshare, but I'd love to stop presenting. Um, but of course, you know, when I'm presenting, that's uh, that's when it would happen. So th this will remain up on the screen until my computer decides to be a little more responsive. And I will talk a little bit about um, the solution circles that uh, we've been doing to try to provide some of that guidance to uh, to case managers. We started uh, identifying. We may have lost you, Wayne. We'll give you one moment. This is why technology alone is not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I think we tried to assist with getting that uh, slide down, and we may have uh, we may have lost Wayne. Well, as we're waiting for him to, to join us, I know uh, Kimmy and Sarah, um, Wayne was uh, going to uh, introduce you. Would um, one of you like to share your experience with the solution circles? And then when Wayne uh, joins us, we can, we'll, we'll tie it all up. Uh, so uh, Kimmy, would you like to go first? Sure, I will get started. So I'm a case manager in the South region um, in the Wallingford office in the private division. And I support an individual who very much values his independence. The challenge is that some of the times his behaviors potentially inhibit um, his success in maintaining that, that independence. And the solution circles were presented to me as an option at exactly the right time. Um, and so I got started back in the fall. And every time I talked to Amy, Patricia, or Wayne, I presented a new wrinkle and they were creative and patient um, in joining me in a really long game of uh, whack-a-mole. Um, because like I said, every time we, we met about every other Wednesday, I presented sort of a change. When I started with them, um, the individual was understaffed and really the remote supports was going to be something that we hoped that would fill a staffing gap, that he would have access to staff when he needed it, because like I said, he's really independent, but he values that personal contact, you know, but then as we talked, his staffing change generally increased and suddenly he was fully staffed. Um, and it was really then became about layering the supports on top of what he already had, because still he very much needs um, a connection to people. Um, we also had to navigate some concerns about the security of the equipment. 
But really through this whole solution circle process, every obstacle that I presented, we found a solution. Um, and so ultimately, I think that we are at a point where we have a plan to layer on remote supports over a combination of self-directed and private provider IHS supports. And there's a very specific low tech solution that's geared to him, one that provides really a person for him to connect to um, at some of the key times when he doesn't have staff. And we think that that will sort of diminish some of the conflicts that he does have. Um, you know, in being feeling alone or feeling frustrated when he does have staff. So it's been a really great process. Thank you perfect. so much. Yeah, perfect examples. And and yeah, thank you, Kimmy. Appreciate that. Um, you know, what I heard is creatively thinking about solutions to the challenges. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that that is underway. So. That's phenomenal. Sarah, I see that you're on as well if you want to talk about your experience. Yes, thank you, Wayne. Um, yeah, I wanted, um, you know, glad for the opportunity to, um, you know, throw my support out there for the um, Solution Circles experience. Um, I, you know, just real quick, I, you know, had one individual um, that has been living in his own place um, for quite a while, but his mom was his kind of natural support. Um, and then when she moved out of town, um, you know, it became clear that he needed a little bit extra help um, more than what he had needed in the past to stay independent. So um, at this point, you know, um, I was able to tap into the solution circle opportunity about a month or so ago. Um, and so, you know, we I've been kind of looking into both assistive technology and the remote support. So we're kind of at that, you know, preliminary stage. We haven't um, actively pursued the remote support. Um, we want to see how the assistive technology that we identified, um, you know, how that's helpful to him. Um, but I, you know, I did kind of take the opportunity to um, tie those two things together and we did um you know look at the um the checklist is the remote support right for me um and i completed that with the family at the time that we were doing the assistive technology assessment so um you know i'm looking forward to seeing how the rest of this plays out um but very you know thankful for that opportunity with the solution circle to really kind of dive into the specifics for for my gentlemen Appreciate that, Sarah. And before I kick it over, I'll just put a plug in. We'll we'll be continuing these solution circles. Um, they were small regional meetings, small amount, but we'll be opening them opening them up to any case manager to drop in, um, probably twice a month, starting in February. And uh, it's a great opportunity to come and and think about how how it might apply to somebody on your caseload. And then you know, as Kyle Corbin mentioned in the beginning. What are those steps to that a case manager needs to take to actually get it going? Uh, and there'll be an interdisciplinary group there to help walk you through. And you can listen to other case managers well as well and their experience along the way. So really appreciate it, Sarah and Kimmy. Uh, thanks for dropping in and thanks for everybody for bearing with me with my technological challenges here. Thanks so much, Wayne. Um, and uh, thanks for um, sharing the information about the solution circles. Um, that I think um, has been a really key point for a fairly new service to uh, go from. I have, you know, I have, um, I'm working with this individual who has some support needs. How, how do I move forward? And it's been a really nice way for case managers to. Um, work through the process and connect people with the right supports. So um, I want to thank all our presenters and we have about five, six more minutes. Um, I, uh, Amy Blazowski has been great. Um, as questions have been coming into the chat, she's been answering some of them. And so um, I just want to go uh, through for those who may not have access to the chat and just go through and then ask our presenters if you have any um, any additions. So the first question that came in was do providers to so the uh, remote support providers attend IP meetings and submit reports. And I think some of you talked a little bit about that. Um, but in terms of team involvement, does someone want to just um, 
share what that looks like. I, Thanks. I, I could kind of share from our perspective an example of a question I get asked a lot. I'll get asked a lot. So if X, Y, and Z were to happen, what do you do? You know, like so if he were if if the person we're talking about were to leave, were to, you know, fall on the floor, were to leave the home, what would you do? And my response is usually, what would you like us to do? What do you think would work best for that individual? And that information that we come to a plan together on doesn't live with us. You know, we know all of the services and all the capabilities of the system, but the people that know the person the best are the ones that can help illustrate which of our options, because there are a lot of different ways we could support people with remote supports. We're going to need to know and talk to those people that know the individual best. Um, I think Pam mentioned it, like that team could include your friends, you know, your, your loved ones, natural support, whoever it is. Um, so we say bring everyone that you think could, could, be, could, could, add to the conversation, could know a little bit of information about, hey, whether someone might forget to wear a wristwatch every day, or will they be more likely to wear something around their neck? Maybe it's as simple as that. So having the team involved is extremely important in, from the very beginning, and I would say uh, along the way at every step too. Thanks, Michael. Uh, the next question that we received, um, and it's, I, th I think I've seen a video that um, has been shared uh, with this exact scenario, but would this be an appropriate service for someone who has a history of using um, 988 suicide hotline in the evening and the team su suspects that they're uh, using it due to loneliness? I Absolutely. can jump on, on that one. Oh, sorry, Pam. Um, no, go ahead, Al. Go ahead. I, what I was going to say is it could be, right? It could be. And so it depends on, on, on really what's going on with that individual and, and is, is this a working solution for them? Uh, certainly something that, uh, a, a tool in the toolbox, right? Something that you could try and see if, if there's a positive impact. The other thing, um, Elisa, if I could just really quick on the last question is all of these systems have reporting mechanisms. So if people want to know um, how many times they're getting in and out of bed or opening and closing doors, those reports can be given back to the team um, at each of those team meetings. So it's important to know that the systems report out also. So people can be there to report, but you can also get statistical data from the machine, from the systems. Thanks, Pam. Um, the next question, can you give some examples of what seizure supports would look like for people who has, a, a person who has a seizure disorder? I'll just start off by mentioning, and I saw Kyle come off mute, but I'll start off by saying that uh, these plans have an in-person component uh, built into it when you when when these are being put together. So, you know, if a person has technology that detects the seizure, for an example, um, and it requires an in-person response. That's all part of setting up a remote support. So I'll I'll pass it over to. I it looks like Michael came off mute. Yeah, you know I I uh, that's a great point, Wayne. I think anything with any sort of kind of uh, biometric markers or anything that might represent something being maybe a, a bit amiss with someone during the day. We're when push comes to shove, we're probably getting that resource involved that could go over to the home when it comes to see just like how you have different types of cell phones that are out there and different tv models there are different sensors that are a wide variety of seizure sen seizure sensors that are looking for biometric markers and health markers there are other devices that are looking for maybe physical tremors maybe in bed as well and that will again go back to what we've all been saying it, it depends on the person you know if someone just has grand mal seizures, or if someone just has seizures that are just the eye movement uh, incidences and events like that, that might then direct us down a certain path in terms of what devices might be used. So um, there are seizure sensors and seizure support devices and other ways that we could see if a seizure is happening. I think it depends on what kind of seizures, how frequent, um, and really what what the, the next steps would be in terms of that person's care plan when they when they do have a seizure. Thanks, Michael. Uh, the next question um, is, are all of the providers who presented today on the qualified provider list? And yes, all of um, our presenters um, are uh, uh, qualified.
qualified providers for remote supports. Um, there was a question, and I think we just covered it around uh, data. Um, is there the ability to uh, collect data? Um, and um, Amy noted in the chat, uh, yep, all sorts of um, the reports can really be customized and, and gather information. It may be behavioral data, it could be calls, it could be movement, um, really depending on uh, that person um, and uh, what makes sense for them. Somebody asked what the level of need is. The LON is the level of need. Uh, that is a tool um, that identifies um, a person's uh, strengths and areas where they may be uh, able to benefit from support. And then um, our uh, director of housing noted that for people that are moving into supportive housing or, um, or um, clustered IHS, this may be a nice option to consider um, as they're kind of um, settling in and uh, uh, acclimating to the new environment. I um, feel like I'm going through these questions really quickly, uh, but I want to make sure that we get to all of them. And uh, then there is a note uh, from Cheryl that says, it seems like this could be very beneficial for individuals who have been characterized as not accepting staffing. Um, they may be open to help, but um, don't necessarily want uh, people to be coming into their apartments or into their environment. Um, can someone speak? I, that resonates with me because I, it, it, that's, I've, I've thought that that may be a very beneficial application. The person who may turn a staff member away at times or just not be there. Um, can someone speak to how that um, may be beneficial? Sure. Yeah, if you yeah. don't mind, I'll grab that one. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Ahead, quick. Um, I think that, you know, the systems can work silently in the background when needed or can be interactive as they're needed. So I think that's a perfect place to use them for when somebody really doesn't want people in their house and bothering them, they can get the same types of supports on demand, which may be a better solution for people. Go ahead, Kyle, I'll let you jump in. All right, those are great points. I'll just tell my one of my favorite stories and I'll make it quick. So we had an individual that was struggling with aggression towards staff. He had some issues with, with law enforcement over aggression with staff. They had looked at, okay, we're gonna add a second staff in there to keep the first staff safe. So now we're doubling the issue with additional staff in place. And finally, the team was like, this isn't gonna work. We have a person here that, that we need to look at an alternative. So remote support was brought in and they they weaned off the staff they got him on the remote support this was over months he very successful doing things that are 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 part of the, you know he's a, a integral part of the community now he's got a job he's doing wonderful i i talked to him i said this was months later i said why was this successful for you you know what do you feel was the the best part of of remote support and he said i love the remote part oh okay you love the fact that people are you know at a distance no 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 I love that when I come home, my remote is where it was when I left and no one is watching my TV. So, you know, those are the, the stories, right? Like that's that's the part, that's the piece. I love One of my that. favorite stories. Yeah. That's a great story. Um, and then uh, Kirsten asks, and I, I can, this resonates as well. Um, I'm thinking about when my uh, seatbelt sensor in my car uh, malfunctioned last week and it beeped at me all day as I was driving around and it was really unpleasant. Can you talk about what happens when there's a sensor malfunction? Well, for our system, um, we get a notification immediately uh, that a sensor is malfunctioned and depending on the person and the, the need for that sensor and the safety around that sensor, would also depend on how fast you change it out, what happens with it. Most of our, uh, and um, Michael and Kyle can talk about those, but most of ours don't make noise like that. So you're not gonna see that happen um, inside the remote support systems. Thanks, Pam. Yeah, P Pam, I think you're exactly right there. Like our, our devices, they send us 
a battery backup device or, or a tamper evidence sensor or something, whatever, whatever happened to it. But it's great because it does, you know, we're not waiting for someone to be in the right room to hear the the buzz going off if something breaks. You know, we're going to know right away. And especially if it's on a night where I live in Wisconsin, we've last week we had negative 30 with the wind chill here. Um, if it's on one of those nights, we know it's three o'clock in the morning, battery backups are starting to buzz off on some of the devices. We need someone to just make sure they've got heat and are safe for the night to begin with. So um, it's really good that with remote supports, we're, you know, the vendors or whoever's looking and, and monitoring can see those malfunctions pretty quickly. So, yeah. Thank you. That is all the questions that were in the chat. Um, I'm mindful that we started a few minutes late. And so, um, so uh, we're extending a few minutes late. Um, does anyone have any additional questions? All right, I would like to thank today's uh, presenters. I think um, you gave an incredibly well-balanced, well-rounded um, picture of what remote supports may be um, in a variety of situations. Um, very excited that this uh, service is um, expanding in Connecticut, and I uh, look forward to continued collaboration. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>